you teach? Well, probably well, the answer to the last part, I guess, is people would say I, I taught children, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, I, in those days you taught everything, all the subjects right across the board. Uh, you were given a particular grade to teach, and I was usually in the grade eight, nine, high school level. And uh, I also did physical education. So part of my day was taken up in the gym with the, uh, with the uh, children. Uh, I became a teacher probably because in the days I grew up, uh, your choices of employment were slim. Yes. Uh, I was told not to go on the boat. I fished all my younger years. Dad was a fisherman. And uh, I helped out where I could. And then we had our own cod traps, etc. But uh, I always was basically told, you stay in school. Uh, it wasn't easy in those days because every cent you could bring in for the family meant an awful lot. There was no insurance or anything in the winter. What you made in the summer had to do you year round. So uh, looking around the area, you didn't have a lot of examples of what to do. And I enjoyed school. And I was heavily involved in sports and organizations. So I guess logically I went into education and, and became a teacher. And then you decided to go into politics. Now, did somebody come to you and say, Loyola, we'd like you to <laughs> run? Or did you decide yourself that you were going to run? No, years, I, I was heavily involved in politics uh, from a very young age. And uh, when uh, Frank Moores became uh, the leader, in fact, as he uh, was campaigning for leadership, uh, I was approached by Moores to get involved with the uh, Tory organization, uh, which I did. I became the secretary, I think, on the, uh, P the uh, Southern Shore PC Association, Furryland District, actually. And at that time, most of the members, practically all of them, I guess, that we saw representing rural Newfoundland, not only our area, came, either came from St. John's or were based here. And you had your lawyers, doctors, well-known business people. And they represented us in the House of Assembly. As we got to the age, I guess, where we started to figure out what was going on, we began to ask the question, why are others coming out representing us? We should be representing ourselves. And a number of us got involved. And uh, in, in uh, a couple of the elections, which uh, the Tories won in Fairyland riding, and then one of our own, Charlie Power, basically my age, uh, got involved. And uh, Charlie was the member there for a number of years, and the whole philosophy of representation changed. I had been approached years when I started first about why don't you run? And I really thought to be, you know, a big MHA, you needed to be a doctor, a lawyer, a scientist, something big. I'm the son of a fisherman. I grew up in a boat. I, I haven't been outside of news too often. And I didn't think that that was my world. Of course, as I got more immersed in it and saw what was going on, I realized that I can play on that team. Uh, somebody said to me when I went to Ottawa, in fact, he said, the first six months you're here, you're going to wonder how you ever got here. After that, you'll wonder how everybody else got here. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, you know, basically, you're all equal in, in, on, on that team. When the opening came in that area, I was approached and asked, will you run? Mm. Uh, tremendous amount of support, actually, from the local area. And I did, and well, the rest is history. Eventually, you became Minister of Education in Brian Peckford's government. Mm -hmm. Now, how much of a challenge was it being Minister of Education at a time when we still had the costly denominational school system? The, during my, I, I was Minister for five years. I, I couldn't get out of it. When Tom Rideout became the leader, I was still asked to stay on as, as Minister during that uh, short term. 
and we have a, a very good relationship with the Newfoundland Teachers Association and with the denominational education uh, committees who looked after the individual church groups. Uh, in fact, when I became minister, the teachers were on strike. And when I was called in by the premier and asked to go in cabinet, I had said there were two departments, not to him, but to myself and anybody who was close, there were two departments I wouldn't want to get if I'm asked. One, social services, and the other, education, because being the teacher, I thought it was too close to it. So when he asked me to become a Minister of Education, well, what do you say? Uh, I, I knew the field pretty well. But the, um, there was a pretty bad strike. Uh, relations weren't good at all. So we had to start mending fences pretty quickly. Uh, we did. We got an agreement signed. Uh, I think there were almost two years it's since the agreement ran out, the, the former agreement. So I basically said to them, look, you know, we're almost up to the next agreement or negotiating period. Why don't we get at it? Because the teachers need a break, they want stability. It wouldn't hurt us. Now we can, for the media's sake, you know, kick each other around for two years and get nowhere. You know my bottom line, I know yours. Mm. So what are we fooling around for? And they said, okay, if we can trust you. And I said, take it to the bank. Mm. And um, we shook hands, actually. And a few days later, we finalized an agreement. First time ever, I believe, before the old one ran out. And I don't think it's happened since. I still have the pen, mm. the way that <laughs> we signed that agreement. You got into federal politics at an interesting time because the Liberals had been in power for quite a while, and uh, it seemed like they were going to continue to be in power for quite a while because the conservative vote was essentially split. You had the Alliance Party, you had the Progressive Conservative Party of Canada, and uh, the Liberals were coming up the middle. Um, was it your view that, uh, you know, we'd, we'd be stuck with a, a, a Liberal government for a long time to come unless the two Conservative parties merged? Was that your view? Absolutely. Uh, I realized that long before I went to Ottawa. Uh, you could see, because of the vicious split, I guess, that happened, you always had little rump groups in different parties. The old Conservative Party, you know, you had your Western rump, you had your Red Tories probably, you had people who were more central uh, under Brian Mulroney, and he did a great job in holding them together. But to do that requires extremely strong leadership, and, and people like Mulroney and Pearson, and you know, the older politicians mm -hmm. seem to have that. Mm -hmm. Both parties, I'm just talking about the two main parties. It was quite obvious that there was going to be no coming together. And as long as both parties existed, there were two possibilities. One was that, as you said, liberals will come up the middle for a lifetime. The other was uh, the people would eventually say, no, something's got to happen, and they would switch their vote probably to the bigger Western party. And uh, the PC party as we knew it would just disappear. When I went to Ottawa, I wasn't there too long. When, uh, one day I was at the coffee machine and a member of the Alliance came by for a coffee. We all knew each other, but basically just to say hello in passing. And I said, you know, I said, answer me a question, will you? I said, why are you up there and we're down here we vote the same way, basically, on all major issues. We agree on almost everything philosophically. And yet, you know, come election time, we fight each other, and the Liberals just go up the middle, and they will. And she said, I totally agree with you. Well, I said, why don't we do something about it? And we got together for, I'd say, a couple of hours just to plan how, because we knew there were some people did not want this to happen. 
and uh, we eventually got some like-minded people and then others uh, from both sides started to join. The leaders at the time were uh, Clark on our side, Mr. Joe Clark, and Stockwell Day on the mm. Alliance side. And neither one of those was in favor of us getting together because it became public that we were meeting occasionally. Uh, we would meet quietly and say, now say nothing about it. And then you go home and it would be on television, you know? Mm. <laughs> Some, somebody would be talking. But anyway, um, I think both of them realized if there is some kind of a coming together, one of us will lose a job, probably both. So there was a lot of pushback, but we got to the point where we didn't care. What made the difference was uh, we had a leadership race in both parties, and uh, Stephen Harper became the leader of the uh, Canadian Alliance Party, Peter McKay became the leader of the uh, Progressive Conservative Party. And both of these were in favor. In fact, I had never met Stephen Harper except again in passing in the common room. And you say hello, you know. Uh, I was in my office and I had a call from Stephen Harper. And he said, I'm told if we're going to bring these parties together, you're the fellow I have to talk to. <laughs> Well, I said, I don't know about that, but I'd be glad to talk to you. I've, I've been involved in this. So we came up and we spent a couple of hours. And shortly after that, he and Peter began to sort of plan how it could happen. And they set up what they call uh, two groups, actually, of emissaries. Big word. That mm -hmm. I don't know if you knew what I meant at the time. But anyway. Uh, on, on their side, they had a member of caucus, a senator, and uh, an outsider. On our side, we had the uh, former uh, premier of Ontario, Bill Davis, great guy, mm. died just recently. Mm. And one of the greatest people, I think, in Canadian politics, a fellow by the name of Don Masinkowski, yes. who also died yep. not long ago. And I was the uh, caucus representative and sort of the convener. So we uh, started to meet, and things started to happen. Uh, so can you take us inside <laughs> those negotiations and, and give us a sense of what you were looking for and how contentious those talks were? Well, I was looking for one thing and one thing only, and that was the creation of a United Party. The word merger is always used. I, I always hesitate to use the word merger. Merger is almost like a takeover. It's not. It's a coming together, you know. But it sounded, and people still think, the Alliance Party absorbed the old Progressive Conservative Party. And they thought that because of the numbers. I believe they had 75 members at the mm. time, and we had a dozen. Mm. And uh, so, it, you know, would see them. They just, uh, that's not the case at all. When we got together, when the alliance came to the table, their view of creating unity then, at the time, this is before any great discussion, was we would be united in the House. We would agree on certain policies. We would vote collectively. And when the election came, we would look at the possibilities of winning. And you would run where you thought you could win. And I would run where I thought my group would win. And if there were areas where we didn't know who could win. We'd toss a coin or whatever. And I basically said, not going to work. Even if we went through that process and we won an election by going that way, which I don't think we can, who's going to be the leader? What policies are we going to, to follow? Because our policies are still a little bit different. If you want, and, and these are words 
right from the record and, and right from me. I said, if we're not here to create one united party, we're out of here. And the response was, now that sounds great, but it won't fly because the first thing, nobody will agree, uh, agree with the name. And I just looked at them, it's, I'm looking at you now, and I said, what's wrong with the Conservative Party of Canada? You call yourselves conservatives, mm -hmm. even though I'm a progressive conservative, I'm always called a conservative. Mm -hmm. There's the Liberal Party of Canada. What is wrong with the Conservative Party of Canada? And nobody could say there was anything wrong with it. And I can take credit, I might be given it, because I don't go look for those things, but with coming up with the name, the Conservative Party of Canada. And then I said we will develop a set of principles. You went on to win the election with uh, Stephen Harper as the leader, Progressive Conservative Party of Canada. You became the Federal Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. Um, <clears throat> but I think it's fair to say that yours and Stephen Harper's relationship with the government of Premier Danny Williams and Danny Williams himself was less than rosy. What was at the core uh, of, of uh, what was the core reason for, th for that uh, souring of, of the relationship? Well, some of it happened before we formed government at all. Look, there's no blame to go around here. You know, people point fingers at Danny, they point fingers at Stephen Harper, they might point fingers at me. All three of us, in this case, I think, played, played a part. I probably caused some of the bad relationship when the local progressive uh, conservative party kicked Fabian Manning out of caucus. Uh, Fabian and I were very close. Well, I was close with all, the member, all of them, collectively. Every single one of them uh, worked on my campaign. I managed their campaign in 99 when Basically, we saved the party from Tobin at the time, and they did very well. And then it led up to Danny becoming the leader and, and uh, the formation of government. But Fabian Manning was, like the others, one of my good friends. And I was really upset when he was kicked out for what I thought was a non-reason. But I was more upset by the way it happened, and in the words of a great Newfoundlander, it, it's not my story to tell, but, uh, and I said it publicly, uh, I upset a number of people. I didn't point fingers, I just said it shows poor leadership. Mm -hmm. Could have been Cox, could have been Cox's chair, could have been, could have been anybody, but it was taken personally and I became a target. I, I was a target during the election prior to forming government. I got very little help, only a couple really helped. One was helping, he got a call to back off and, and did. Uh, it didn't matter, I won. And uh, it went on from there. But afterwards, there seemed to be a, when we farm government, there seemed to be, a, I guess, a truce. And we started talking, certainly, and working together. And then we had the convention, the local PC convention. And the Prime Minister came down and spoke at the luncheon. Uh, standing ovation, great speech, standing ovation. I was sitting right opposite the Premier, and both of us were on our feet with everybody else. After that, and we were going back to Ottawa that evening. We had a caucus meeting, I believe, that night or the next morning, and, and I flew back with the Prime Minister. But in between, he and the Premier met. And on the plane, I said to him, uh, uh, Prime Minister, how did your meeting go with the Premier? And he said, pretty good, you know, he's a tough negotiator. And that's about all he said. So I'm thinking, that's as much as you can expect. And that night, uh, the Premier went on stage with the, the goose egg speech that we talk about. There'll be no Tories win in, in this province next election. 
I have no, even to this day, I don't know what caused it. It might have been the meeting, it might have been something, I don't know. But that cut off communications. And, and that word was probably the key word. Because if you don't talk, particularly in this racket, mm. you don't get a lot done, unless you're strong enough on your side to do most of it, or I can do the same thing. But even then, there are an awful lot of other things that probably, if we're talking and working together and planning, that we could get done. Before uh, we end the interview, uh, Loyola, I want to ask you what it felt like for a, a fellow from Renews with Irish ancestry to be asked to become the Canadian ambassador <laughs> to the Republic of Ireland. Uh, I guess a dream come true would be the quickest way. I grew up in a, a home, all my ancestry, right up to me anyway, pure Irish, mm -hmm. right through. Our house was filled with music all the time and, and Irish music. The, the Big Six program was very popular and you probably can't yeah. even remember that. Oh, group. I remember the Big Six but program, the, um, yes. <laughs> and the McNulty family. J.M. Devine. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Once a number, now an institution. <laughs> <That's> if you <right. laughs> remember correctly. Uh, our concerts at home were always... The, three of the nuns who taught me had come directly from Ireland. All the rest, I would say, had Irish roots. Our parish priests had been all Irish. The, when I was growing up, uh, Monsignor McCarty had come from Kilkenny, where my own people on mom's side came from. And uh, he built that beautiful grotto that we have in Renews based on the mass rock, where mass was said during Peel and Times, only one in the country. Oh, I have to get the plug in for that. All, all kinds of, of history, Irish history mm. in that area. So shortly after we got elected, maybe a year in, uh, it looked like they were going to try to defeat us. We were a minority government. And somebody approached me, a good friend of mine, and said, if you're not running, are you? And I said, no, I've, I've made up my mind to that. And he said, uh, there's a vacancy in Ireland so if the election is called and you don't run, would you consider, now consider means I'll put your name forward because there is a screening process. Yes. And I said, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like that. But there was no election and actually Pat Binns, former premier of PEI, went to, to Ireland mm -hmm. as the ambassador. So that was fine, and uh, we had the election. I retired, I'm home, starting to settle down, renews. And I get a call saying, uh, there's an opening in Boston, I believe. Would you like to have your name put forward as a consul? And I said, no, I'm not looking for a job. I've retired, my third time, I think, retiring. <laughs> but uh, it's a place, I have a lot of cousins down there, more than I have home. Uh, great hockey team, great basketball team, great uh, ball, baseball team. Uh, that would be a place I could enjoy and be close to home. But no, thank you. Well, they said, um, Pat Binns is interested in moving to Boston. I said, okay, that's good. Pat would be a good fellow. They said, but that means Ireland is open. Would you consider your name being put forth for Ireland? And I would say it took me... 10 seconds <laughs> to say, uh, yes, it's, yes, it's the only thing that I can think of that I would have said yes to. What were some of the highlights of your time as ambassador? The, the embassy, not huge, of course, smaller country, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we had 18 people involved in the embassy, but you had your trade section, you had your immigration section, uh, you had your business section in particular, trade promotions, etc. A very busy place, uh, a lot of work. I always believed um, an ambassador's job was to sell your country, mm -hmm. to get out around. I can say I had an official meeting in every single one of the 26 counties. Wow. And some people might say there are 32 counties in Ireland, yes, but six are in Northern Ireland and right. come under uh, the embassy in London, actually. Mm -hmm. I had no jurisdiction, but we did work closely because one of the things 
we were asked to do was follow through on the Good Friday Agreement and, where possible, bolster the relations between North and South. I think we did that in spades in two or three ways. The three different parts up in the Donegal Dirty area, down around the Monaghan, Armagh area, and over in the Carlingford area next to Nafar from Belfast, etc. We uh, started uh, Darcy McGee Summer School. Uh, we, one of the players in that is Pat O'Callaghan from here, who mm -hmm. is actually from that area. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has become a forum to debate relationships and history and opened up door. It's just amazing what that has done, and, and we can take a fair amount of credit for that. Loyola, thank you for being on the program. Uh, it's been a fascinating conversation. I've really enjoyed it, and uh, it's good to see you looking so well. <laughs> Obviously, well, retirement agrees with you. Thank uh, you. It has, and I, uh, once again, I don't do this uh, very often, but Carl, you've been good to me over the years. I enjoyed your visit to Ottawa some years ago, yeah. and I'm glad to do it. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And that's it for this edition of Carl Wells Point to Point. Thank you for watching. See you again next time. If you want convenience, Marie's Money Mart is here for you. A one-stop shop for a variety of products, homestyle bread, sandwiches, plus check out our fresh